Yo, yo, yo. So if you don't eat podcasts, look, we're back. It's a special Sunday edition, all right? Uh, we usually don't do Sundays. Uh, however, uh, I really wanted to have this conversation, so I wanted to make sure that it happened tonight. Uh, this is going to be, uh, be, be a good conversation for a lot of people to hear, a lot of people to see. Uh, you know, the thing when it comes to wholesaling is one of the things that I don't see talked about enough is the experiences and things that could potentially happen when you are wholesaling a deal and the reality of dealing with title issues and uh, you know deals not going through or you know getting to the day before closing and people telling you that uh, the title company calling you and say hey yeah it's not going to close and all these different things so i want to have this conversation i want it to be helpful uh for for you guys that, that watch it uh, and uh, I've got a, uh, a guest tonight, uh, Malik Howard. Uh, looking forward to having him uh, join me tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of his experiences dealing with title issues uh, when trying to facilitate closings, as well as go through uh, one of his deals uh, that he's done as well. I know we got a lot of you family in here also. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I see some of the yous going up in the comments. Uh, if, you, if you're in here, definitely throw that you symbol up. So I know you're here. Um, Yo, what up, man? I see you guys in here, man. Uh, I see you guys in the comments. Much love, much love. So I'm going to go ahead and get uh, Malik in here, man. Let's get to the conversation. Let's start talking about it. Uh, guys, at the end of the conversation, we're going to do Q&A. So if you got questions, uh, you know, hang tight. Uh, I definitely want to answer those at the end for you and go over that information. Uh, Malik, I'm going to bring you in, my man, my man. What's going on? Got to unmute. Oh, my oh my what's, what's good, man? I'm, I'm I'm super happy to be here. What's up? What's up? Uh, no doubt, man. It's good to have you. I appreciate you dropping through. Um, so, guys, a couple of quick housekeeping rules, church announcements. You know how it is, especially since it's Sunday. All right. Go share this link. Tag some people. Let them know they need to be on here right now watching this conversation. So, uh, Malik, introduce yourself, man. Who are you? Where are you from? And uh, let, it, let us know, man. Yeah, so Malik Howard um, from Woodbridge, Virginia, which is not too far from Richmond, about an hour and a half north, probably like 25 minutes, 30 minutes from D.C. Um, right now I'm in the IT space uh, doing some consultant work full time, and I've been wholesaling probably, probably for about a year and a half now, um, but with a major span of consistency for about – eight to eight to nine months where I was really hitting it strong. Um, so, you know, I have a few deals under my belt. Um, I believe I have five, um, five within a probably about a seven month span. So it was it was pretty good, you know, just trying to figure out how to maneuver. And I was actually doing most of my marketing in um, the Michigan, uh, Michigan market. So, you know, I was, you know, doing it, you know, uh, out of state and it was going pretty well so yeah i'm just glad to, happy to be here with the youth fam i was on the youth youth fam as well um charged the U university that helped me a lot close some of my deals so um happy to be here yeah no doubt man i, I appreciate that so um i like to ask this question to all the guests uh so I, I gotta ask you this man what what is it that got you in the wholesaling in the first place and uh you know what what was what was the key thing? Because I know you said you dealt with consistency issues. So, like, what was the key thing that helped you start to become, uh, ultimately become more consistent? Right. Yeah, so I got into wholesaling. Um, I actually got introduced to Rich Dad, Poor Dad through a friend. And I always knew I wanted to get extra money on the side, but I didn't know how to do it. You know, I wasn't aware about real estate investing at all. So that book basically changed my mindset on, you know, how money works and how to invest. And it was kind of like just, I don't know, divine intervention, man. I was just on YouTube one day looking up, you know, how to get more money. And then um, a wholesaling video popped up. Oh, uh, wow. So you're like on YouTube <laughs> searching yeah. like, all right, like, how do I make more money, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and literally like a whole, whose video do you remember whose it was? It was a Breakfast Club interview of, um, what's the dude from Baltimore again? Um, I know you know his name. I forgot his name. I don't. It's on the tip of my Mark tongue. But Mark Whitten. Mark Whitten. Yeah, he was on Breakfast Club, and I saw the interview. It was like you know, make money with no money, and I was like, all right, cool. 
So I, I looked it up and, you know, that just, I went crazy from after that. So I love um, it, man. I love it. As far as addressing your second question about consistency, um, man, that was just, I think entering into a group, you know, being in a group like Charged Up You or being a part of a Facebook group like, you know, Max Maxwell's wholesaling group, they show you like the real side of it. And they, they, you know, they tell their stories of how long it may take. So just being surrounded by like-minded people, you know, in the industry, trying to accomplish the same goals, I think it kind of pushes you to just stay motivated when things go dry, because they will go dry. <laughs> Tell me about <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know all about how that goes. And that's a good point, man. First, shout out to Mark Witten, man. That's that's the guy. Uh, much, much love to him up in Baltimore, man. Great brother. And uh, yeah, so like when I put Charged Up together, I, I wanted to create that accountability component of, mm -hmm. of making it really a group and that chat feature where people in the group could, could interact with each other. Uh, right. and, and really, you know, network and build relationships if that's what they wanted to do. But yeah, I mean, having, I, and I talk about this sometimes, I think I talked about in the last video a little bit, you know, it's part of the difficulty when you start is that you're really kind of in a lonely space. And, and the reason being is like, you know, the trajectory of like all wholesalers, I feel like is the same. You come into the business, you find out about the information and then what you get crazy excited, you know, it's yeah. like, Oh shit, like I can do this and make 5,000, 10,000, 20, and you get pumped up. And so you get like up on this huge, huge high. And then you actually start doing it and realize that it takes work, it takes effort. And so, you know, then you kind of come back down a little bit uh, on that energy as well. And, and where you need that accountability, where you need that group, is where you kind of get back down a little bit because you don't have anybody directly around you uh, that's doing the same thing. Then it's hard to, you know, have somebody to communicate with, to share those experiences, have those conversations. So, yeah, I, I agree. An accountability group, where, wherever it is, whether it's charged up, uh, you know, shout out to Max Maxwell. That's my guy. His Facebook group. Um, yeah, you got to communicate with people, interact with people. And that's that that little stuff like that is what's going to keep you going uh, on a daily basis. A lot of people fall off from wholesaling and don't do it successfully or never get that opportunity to close their first deal. Because when they come to that low, they don't they haven't surrounded themselves with anybody that's actually trying to do this business and do it the right way. And so that's what kind of makes them kind of teeter off and kind of fall out of the business. So uh, I definitely appreciate you uh, bringing that up. Um, so I know we're going to talk about one of your deals. Uh, but mm -hmm. one thing I want to talk about is, you know, title issues. And so, right. you know, I've had a lot of different scenarios and situations where. I've been affected by title issues. I remember at, at one time, I think in 2019, I believe, uh, I mean, we had over a hundred thousand dollars in assignment fees that got blown up in an instant uh, because of title problems. Right. Uh, and that, that was a month where I was really banking on and planning for that a hundred something thousand to come in. Now the, all those deals ended up closing, but not like six months later. So not anywhere near, uh, when they were supposed to, what title issues have you, f have you run into? Like, is there mm -hmm. anyone that kind of really stands out to you uh, that you kind of commonly have run into? And we can, we can tap in and, and talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So my first deal in particular, that was probably the worst title issue. And, you know, this particular problem had me lose out on $7,000 with my first deal. So it went from 17 to 10. It was still a great first one, but, you know, just it adds up over time when you have these little kinks where, you know, sellers want to renegotiate and it all adds up. But first, the first deal, I mean, you know, it took me like five months to get the first one because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. So it was a long process for the first one. I wasn't using a dollar. Manually <laughs> dollar. <laughs> I didn't even know what a dollar was. Man, it was, down, it was man. terrible. Yeah. I got my yard sign stolen, my bandit sign stolen, all oh, of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a struggle. So then I started to figure things out. I actually came to a meetup that you was at, and you know you were giving me some tips. Learned about the dollar, and I think I closed like a month after that. But Dope. um the issue was that so I moved into a virtual market, and I didn't know much about it. So I was asking on a Facebook group, investor Facebook group in Michigan, like, hey title company references. 
saw you know a couple people mention a couple i chose one the issue was that that title company they were investor friendly but they weren't like we just gonna get the job done like they were kind of more so i think they're more on the retail side so i you know i got a property on a contract in michigan but there was a couple issues with um with the title so that you know it's really common in michigan where they do quick claim deeds um right. where they just transfer the title through a document they don't go through traditional closing so some right. title companies are worried about you know putting insurance on the title so i put it you know i got her under contract it's about to make 17 pushed it to that first title company it took them weeks like they were like oh we can't do it we got it might you might have to do a quiet title which is like yeah. lawyers get involved and then they're like, yeah. okay, we can come up with something. So it literally went by like a month. And let, I was, let me ask you a question. Sorry, how, how, how close to closing did they tell you that? And I know it probably, I know they didn't tell you immediately. So like how, like when were you supposed to close? And then when did you yeah. find it? We were supposed to close, I believe three weeks tops from when I got it signed. So I like to give myself like a 21 day cushion. They yeah. probably told me like two and a half weeks. Like, okay, we got issues. Like I'm two like, and a half. Bro. weeks? Yeah, like to, like from when I had signed it. Yeah, so probably so like from closing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, so, they, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, I was. I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was just like, man, are you serious? So, I still didn't really know what to do because this is my first time dealing with a title company. So they're saying, all right, we gonna handle it. So literally a month goes by. Like I had to get the seller to sign an extension on the contract. Yeah. Um, so long story short, you know, I ended up going to a different title company that most wholesalers use. And um, it took them two days. Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in, in, in the meantime, the seller just got antsy because it took to so long. And he called They've me got right the before. Expectation that is closing in three weeks. Exactly. So once like that month, probably six weeks in, he, he was he called me right before the next when we was actually about to close and was like, I want more money. I'm like, yeah. bro, are you serious? So yeah, he took seven grand away because it took too long for the first title company to close. Ah, uh, so the seller's like, nah, I need seven back. Yeah, he just asked for more money to get um, just because it was just taking so long, taking so long. He had time to think about it more. And he's like, I want some more money. So it just, you know, yeah, the title. Yeah. Help so, me up. So, so here's one thing you guys got to you got to understand. You want to make sure that you do. So any time that you open escrow and what I mean when I say open escrow, when you see when you get a contract signed with a seller and you then send that contract in to the title company or the attorney. All right. And I recommend you always use an attorney. But when you send that in, all right, that's opening escrow. So they've now opened escrow. They're doing a title search on that property. What you got to understand. All right. And this isn't I don't this isn't right, but this is just how it is. And I've used different title companies and this is how it goes. So these title companies and attorneys, truthfully speaking, they're not picking your file up until that until two times until the title report comes back in. But when the title report comes back in, if your closing isn't for another week or two weeks, all right, they're not going to go all the way through the title right then and there. But what generally tends to happen is they don't pick that file up again until one, two or three days before closing when they're going to go do that paperwork for that particular closing. Because you got to understand they're, they're managing, you know, tons of different closings per month. So general rule of thumb, you must follow up on all files that you have pending closing. So any file you have in escrow, you must follow up with your title or attorney's office twice a week. It doesn't matter how annoyed with you they get, how much they don't want to talk to you. Okay. Because your closing isn't for another three weeks or whatever the case might be, but you need to follow up once I'm sorry, twice a week to ask about the status of the file. All right. The reason that's important is because when the title work comes back in, you want them to take a look at the title work right then, because you want to know at that time if there's any title problems uh, whatsoever. All right. Uh, so I see somebody asking um, why an attorney over a title company. So an attorney, in my opinion, is just better. Sometimes they cost 
100 150 dollars more per transaction but when you have legal things that happen quiet title issues things of that nature you guys gotta understand that the, the attorneys are the ones that figure these things out when you're dealing with a title company you're not dealing with an attorney you're having to take that they're they're having to take that and they're facilitating it to an attorney on your behalf all right that there's there's just kind of signing off on deeds and things of that nature it's much, much better to start dealing with a title company uh, directly 110%. So, um, so I mean, that's one of the issues that you've dealt with. I know a lot of people have dealt with that. Um, and, and the other thing is most of these files are going to have title problems because we're buying from people ultimately that are in distress. You know, so, you know, dealing with people who like have title problems is normal. There's not, I mean, how, you've done a, a few deals, right? So like, I'm I'm sure all your deals have had some sort of title, you know. Yeah, not that's crazy. Yeah. Problem. You get what I mean? What's the craziest title problem you've had? Man, <laughs> it was a. Uh, I don't know necessarily know if it was a title problem, but the seller was just a little crazy. So it got title confused. It got me confused. We were all confused. So it was, it was insane. That's just I'm gonna crazy. probably tell that story uh, later. No doubt. All right, cool. Yeah, we'll definitely tap into that. Uh, so like another one that I've seen is, and and I see this happen sometimes, where there might be an old mortgage on the property. So there's an old mortgage or old lien, whatever the case might be. And that lien was with a small bank or you know a small business put that lien on the property. And what happens is that lien could have been paid off, but nobody went and recorded a satisfaction of the lien. And so what that means is when somebody does a title search, even though that's been paid, it still reflects as if that lien, the, the money for that lien is owed. I don't know if you have you ran into that at all, Malik? I haven't ran into that, but I did have situations like, you know, Michigan per se, Cleveland market as well. When there's a lot of quick claims and people lose track of who had the last warranty deed on the property, Right. So then yeah. it's a backlog of uh, of taxes owed on the property and nobody can claim it. So I actually was about to close on a deal in Cleveland, but then there was like $40,000 in taxes. So the deal, it was more taxes than the property is worth. So uh, I couldn't even close on that one because we couldn't get it squared away. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you, man. Yeah. So, so sometimes they fall through and, and that, that's unfortunate. I hate when deals fall through because of title problems, but you know, the reality of it is, is that sometimes that happens. The other mm -hmm. piece too, guys, is that, you know, not every attorney or title company is going to want to work through a file that has title issues. Mm -hmm. So even if I've had title companies tell me that something couldn't close that I was able to take to another title company and actually get it closed, kind of like Malik just mentioned as well. And yeah. so you want to make sure you're dealing with a company that's doing your closings that you make sure that they are familiar with working through and dealing with title issues. And that just comes from communication and talking to them uh, about, uh, about the deal they have. Um, Malik, let's jump into, uh, cause I think it'll be good uh, learning experience for everybody watching this. Let's jump into, you know, one of your deals. Um, so let, let's start it off by uh, where did you source the lead? And then how did you originally contact the lead? Okay. So you want to hear about like the good deal or the really bad, Crazy experience. Nah, let's, do the, let's do the crazy one. Let's do the bad one. Let's All do right. the bad one. <laughs> so yeah, this one was in Michigan too. I was doing a lot of properties, uh, filtering, filtering vacancy, um, absentee, and liens on properties. So I was using PropStream. Dope. So my okay. go-to is PropStream for for lead sourcing. I also use yours as well. That was prior to I think when you released it. So. Yeah. I was using PropStream. Um, I had kind of a niche going on because I, I found a buyer who was who worked for a hedge fund. So they were looking for like buying properties that were more so for rental. So like 40K properties that gave $100, uh, $100 a month in you know income that was rented out. So I was gotcha. kind of tabbing my search to that. Um, so I came across a property in Inkster, Michigan. Um, I didn't really do too much in Detroit, but it was the outskirts of Detroit. And, um, you know, we locked it up. The lady, it, it was going to be a small deal. I was trying to do a lot um, 
more so volume, smaller gotcha. deals, just yeah. because the nature of how Michigan is. Like it's you know it's a cheaper market. Um, try to get you know five, seven, four to seven, keep rolling and rolling. So yeah, you can, you can get you can get in and out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know I, I locked it up. So I. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. So I get on the phone with the lady. She's already furious. I mean, you know, she she owed back taxes on the property. Um, it was a pretty good deal. I was probably going to get like five grand. You know, that was solid for what I was looking for. So I negotiated with her and, you know, she was really short and she, I don't know, man. The first thing though is like, I called her and I said, hi, is this Luis? Oh, I don't want to say the name. I said the name. <laughs> Now nah, you good, good. If, yeah. if she said yes, this is this is the person. So I'm like, cool. So we go from there. Um, next thing I know, you know, I found a buyer for it, and I knew I was gonna get a certain amount, but then I feel like I didn't negotiate properly. So I went back to the lady, and I asked her, hey, I told her like, hey, I, I ran the numbers again. It's not really gonna work at this. Blah blah blah. So I got her down another thousand, um, which was okay. So she was irate about that already. Um, she just wants to get the house sold. You know, she was kind of cursing me out, whatever. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, we eventually locked it up and started going through the title process. So you guys were actually involved, the youth, um, charge of you, because I actually asked Mark, and I think I asked you what I had to do in this situation. So I'll probably say a couple weeks went by, you know, we're trying to get ready to close. And then she just was ghost ghost for like two weeks. Oh wow. Um, yeah. She goes ghost for two weeks. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, you <laughs> we already said we were gonna close on this. So right. I hit you guys up and I tried so many things. I tried to scare her. I was like, you know, if you don't close this property, you're gonna lose your house. So that didn't work. So I think I tried like three other methods, and then you was like, you gotta do my pullback method. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So wait, for, before you go into that, break out the ex explain the pullback method for the the people don't know. Pull, the pullback method is something I teach. Uh, it 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 works like crazy. So kind of, if you don't mind, real quick, kind of explain that. Yeah, it's it's basically when you you let the the seller know, like, okay, I'm I'm interested, but I'm really not that pressed, and I have other properties that <clears throat> I'm looking at. Um, so. I think the first part of the fullback method, just to get their attention is, or this may be something separate, but you have a text where you say, hey, not sure what's going on. You know, I thought we were, you know, trying to close on the property, you know, but you said, you asked, did, did I do something wrong? And when yep. I asked that, you know, then I just let her do her thing. A couple of days later, she finally hit me. Um, and I just kind of just I don't know, it's kind of like stop pressing things out and just let it let it come to you. No doubt. Um, so yeah, and it's funny because Mark had, had texted me. He was like, "Bro, she probably went ghost because she just wants more money." And I'm like, yeah. "I don't know. We agreed." So, so she ended so here's up one in a thousand dollars. So I, I'll say this real quick. So, and this I want you guys to know this. It's always about the money. All right. And anytime you get in pushback from a seller, anytime a seller starts to ghost you, whatever the case might be, it's always primarily going to be about the money. And so a simple question that you got to ask sellers when you're in situations like this, because they'll tell you that it's everything but the purchase price. Oh, I got to talk to my mom. Oh, I'm waiting to hear from my, you know, oh, I don't think I'm going to sell until the spring. It's always the price. And so one key question that you got to ask the sellers when you're in these scenarios is, you know, hey, Malik, you know, I, I appreciate that. I'm super excited to work with you. I'm glad that we were able to create a win-win situation. But, you know, before we sign the contract and everything, I just want to make sure, because if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm absolutely going to do it. So I just want to make sure, I mean, how do you feel about the price? And so what, what you're doing, I, I just did this the other day. What, what you're doing when you do that is when you getting them to double down on their commitment to do the deal with you all right that lets you know for sure they're going to be moving forward when they make that second commitment but two what you're doing is that if it is really about the price or they're hesitant because of price 
they again they don't want to say it so you're creating a situation where they can just go ahead and jump out and say that right you know uh yeah. and so giving them that opportunity to do so then can recreate that conversation or jump start that conversation again so that you can focus on getting the deal closed right and and it was just it was really over a thousand dollars like she did all that for a thousand dollars i'm like bro you can have, you can have a thousand dollars like right she yeah. really went ghost for three weeks yeah <laughs> three and, weeks. They, and instead of just saying hey malik i need another thousand dollars for this to make sense so you're calling you're texting whatever the case might be you can't get her back uh you break out that text message ironically uh the apartment complex that i was telling you about before we got started yeah. um i've been working that guy for two and a half months all right yeah. and we it's, it's been a lot of back and forth kind of spinning the wheel and we just couldn't couldn't get this guy to sign off on the contract right so I hit him with the same text that I gave you guys, right? So I hit him with that text. Finally, what that text does is it makes them give you a quality type of response because it's 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 a very kind of like, hey, I don't know what I did wrong. Right. And so it, it evokes emotion and makes them want to respond back to you. Right. So, you know, I was able to get him to respond back and then, you know, try to, to fi figure out that again, same thing was price. So again, my suggestion is for you guys to try to jump on price in advance. If you're seeing that somebody's hesitant or they're telling you they need to talk to somebody else or I need to run this by my attorney. Hey, look, I know you need to take it by your attorney, Malik, and that's perfectly fine. You should go ahead and run that by them. But I mean, everything aside, you know, the attorney aside and whatnot, Malik, how do you feel about the price on the on the contract? Like you got to isolate and back them down to that spot and you'll find out like in this situation, it was over a thousand bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so so what kind of starts to happen? Uh, after that, and let's walk through this a little bit. So, um, okay. if you're, you're working a prop stream list, you know, you start going through this, uh, you know, this stuff with the seller, and you finally get her under contract. What do you get her under contract at? Man, the property was, I think it was like eight, 17 grand. It's cheap up there, man. Yeah, it's crazy. All right. So, guys, you can get a house in <laughs> For 17,000, you get a house in Michigan. All right. So, 17,000. Yeah. Okay. And uh, are you using it as is comp method? How do you come up with the 17? Yeah, so I was using the as if comp method because um, I think that's the easiest thing. Like, I don't, you know, I don't really know repair cost. Right. Um, so that's, you know, once you showed me that a while ago, that it just made everything simple. And then I also had uh, just some references to go off to with, you know, based on what my buyers were looking forward to. So, you yeah. know, I had buyers that were like, hey, if you get anything in this price range, you know, gotcha. it needs, yeah, it know. needs minimal work. It gives this much of, you know, rent this, this you know, per month, then I'll buy it. So I kind of got lucky on that side, too. That sounds like the hedge fund buyer, I'm guessing, that was, was saying that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how did you find that relationship? Because that's a powerful relationship to have. Yeah. If you can find it and, and feed them deal flow. Um, yeah. How? How were you able to find that relationship and start feeding some deals to them? Yeah, I found it on Facebook. So I just, that's the first thing I did when I entered the virtual market was just type in whatever city, major city, and then real estate investors. And then I just joined all the Facebook groups and then I just started posting in there and posting my deals. She bought like three, two or three deals from me. So the first one she told me who she was and what she was looking for. Um, so and some of these people have obligations to spend money. So it's, it's crazy. Like if you can find the right stuff, you know, you can pitch them everything, everything you have. Um, so it was, it was a pretty good situation. Although I did get caught up in a dilemma one time where she got too comfortable with me giving her stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, I had a buyer who could offer me more, but then she she told me like, hey, if you want to lose me as a client, like you go ahead and you know, uh, wholesale to the other person. I'm like, what? I'm like, you gonna do that? So yeah. it was a weird situation and I didn't know what to do. So I just. Yeah, I business, like business is tough, right? You know, uh, how, much did, how much did you leave on the table? I lost like two or three grand on the table. In hindsight, I don't know if it's the right choice, but. 
So here, here's my opinion. I think it was the right choice, but I'll tell you why I think it was the right choice. I don't think she should have bullied you like that, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you can always make that up on volume with the volume buyer. Right. So, you know, how I look at that with, with volume buyers is, you know what, I don't need to I don't I don't need to hit a, hit this on the head today. You know, like I don't I don't need to the two, I can wait. I can not make the two to three grand on this deal because I know I'm going to send you ten, sell you 10 more deals this year. Right. Um, so I'll get that. I'll get that back uh, on, on volume, so to speak. So um, right. so you're, 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 you're in this deal. Um, you get it under contract, like I said, or like you said, rather for the 17. How mm -hmm. do you go about this is a virtual market. You're not in Michigan. Yeah. So how do you, how do you go about property photos? Because it's a big question that people have. How do you go about getting property photos? Uh, how do you go about you know coordinating getting buyers inside the property? How do you do that when you're in, you're working a market that you're not actually in? Yeah, so I got my older brother up in Detroit. So you know I brought him in on the business. I had him literally watch YouTube videos. I wrote up some notes for him on how everything works. So it was almost like an onboarding for him for like a whole three weeks to to a month. Um, and then I'm saying, hey, you know, we can split these deals. I just need you to go build rapport with, with the sellers in person and take pictures and send them to me. That's all you got to really do. So I purposely chose that market because it made sense to me. And also my brother was there. So I, I was trying to find other markets with friends and family that I trust. Yeah. Um, and I also branched out one time and, and did a different market. And I just did Craigslist postings. Um, and, and hired somebody to do that for me too. So it's not too, it's, it's really easy. It's the same thing as being in your own market. Just find somebody you trust to, yeah. Find somebody you trust to take the photos. Yeah. And that's critical. So, you know, I tell this to people, um, you know, people think that virtual wholesaling is like this big different type of business or it's a completely different way to wholesale. And it's not, it's literally the exact same thing that us aside from, you're not physically in that particular location. So what Malik is talking about is just making sure that you have some boots on the ground, whether that's whether you guys in, in, the, in charged up, whether that's another charged up member, whether that's somebody that you've met in a Facebook group, whatever the case might be, a family member. You know, you, you just build a relationship with somebody that can go uh, take care of some of the things that you need to get done uh, at, at a particular property. And, and like Malik said, Craigslist could be uh, a good resource as well. So. Uh, properties under contract. Your mm -hmm. brother, I believe you said, is in Michigan and he's taking the pictures, kind of facilitating things. Um, how does the, the buy part of this work? So the buyer comes in. Who, who's the what does the buyer look like? What's the buyer profile? Are you guys taking the first offer that comes in? How does that how does that work? Right. So I had like a, a buyer's list set up um, just based on Facebook groups. That Facebook group allows you to just say, hey, Who's buying? Some Facebook groups don't like that, but so I got my little list set up, and I kind of felt what I can do just based on previous uh, properties that I sold there. So I have yeah. probably about three parties interested. Um, in this case, you know, I had a guy who considered it better for a flip because it did need work, minor work, and then there was someone else who wanted to just put it back on the market as a rental. Um, so it was I, I, it was a diverse set of buyers for that one. I got pretty lucky with that one. So um, it's always you know good when you have multiple demands, so you can just figure out who you want to you know give it to. Yeah, absolutely. And I talk about that a lot. You know, I like the open house method. You know, where you you know get a lot of buyers you know to the property, and uh, you know you can create a scenario where you really get that highest and best offer uh, when it comes to right. selling it. So, uh, you get your buyer. Do you require proof of funds? What's your process like with that? Yeah, so this particular buyer, um, they just had so much credibility in the group. I didn't even ask for it because I, and it was just like I seen them already buying stuff, and you know people were referring to them. So I didn't, but I have done that basically with the other buyers who I didn't know who were interested. You know, throughout my tenure of, of doing this, I would ask for proof of funds, and they'd send me something. Um, but one thing I do want to say is like, can't let buyers like try to you know base you and and, and punk you because this dude try to do that with me. Talk about that. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, he. So this dude was kind of kind of 
He was kind of weird. He's cool, but like he just his energy's too high. So like he was just like, no, nah, like you, we already met at the meetup. You know, I met your brother. Y'all cool. Like, how you not gonna try to sell this to me, bro? Like, I'm like, bro, relax. Like, so it's like you gotta just keep it at a business level. No, <laughs> like, he was really trying to base me out. Like, I, I called my brother. I'm like, bro, like this your boy. Like, you gotta right, right, right. Like. So yeah, I had so to really did that. Like I had to really tell him. I kind of let it slide a little too much. Like the first couple times we talked, but then it was just one conversation. I'm like, nah. Like <laughs> we just yeah. gonna keep the business we're in it. So. And and so here's what I want you guys to make sure that you understand, if nothing else tonight. As wholesalers, see this is this is the perception they make you have. They make you believe that wholesalers are at the bottom of the totem pole, all right? And they make you feel or think that wholesaling, like that's something people do when they don't have money to really get into the business and buy property. But here's the deal, okay? See, wholesalers are needed in the ecosystem for things to properly function. Mm -hmm. See, the reason this buyer interacted with Malik that way, the reason that buyer treated Malik that, like that, it's because the buyer wasn't capable of going out and getting their own deal flow. They can't do what we do. They can't go out and grind and work in the way that we are working to really get deals under contract, direct to seller and facilitate your own deals. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is they're dependent on wholesalers, people like us, to be able to bring them deals so that they're able to make money flipping houses, renting houses, whatever the case might be. And they need those deals so bad that they will try to punk you or they will try to, to talk crazy to you or whatever the case might be about bringing the deal to them or trying to hold that over your head. Hey, I'm never going to buy from you again if you don't bring the deal to me. And so the mindset shift that you guys got to make is that, oh, wait, so the buyer needs me for them to be able to do their business. Right. And so then once you realize this, you're able to put a premium on top of what we're doing, because the end of the day, we're the ones that are creating deal flow in the market. We're as wholesalers, we're controlling the majority of the deal flow that takes place in the market. And so you have to work and interact with people based on that. And that's why we do things like highest and best. That's why we do things like require the proof of funds. And so, you know, when it, don't don't let my point is don't let buyers talk to you. But so crazy. I know when you're first starting out, sometimes, you know, you, you don't understand this yet. And so you, you'll allow these people to, to, to do things like that. I'm not saying I've never been in that position before and, and had somebody interact with me that way. But what I've learned over time is that I, I realized this a couple of years ago at a conference. It's like, oh, wait. So everybody here has a problem of having deal flow. They're not getting enough deals. I don't have a deal flow problem because I do my own marketing. And then that's when I realized, oh, they need me more than I actually need them. And so I want you guys to make that mindset shift and think that way uh, when you're doing this business and interacting with people. So um, what did the buyer contract on this one at? I know you said you had it at 17. So you sell it to a buyer for how much? 22. 22. All right. So decent, yeah. decent spread. All right. So yeah. decent. Spread. You're making five grand. That's good money. OK. What problems do you start running into? Well, yeah, that's when the seller went ghost. So you can raise a thousand from that. So now we have four because she wanted that extra cash. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, it was an issue with that. Um, but it, it just got it got crazy. So, you know, the, the seller went ghost. We finally reconciled that with a thousand dollars. So, OK, you know, we're going to closing now. So I had to get her to sign an extension as well because, you know, she took forever. Um, the other issue was that we finally got to probably the day before closing. Um, actually, this is like a week before closing. She doesn't trust anything. So she's like, I just want my money. And I'm like, that's not how it works. So I had to really guide her. I had to literally call her and call the title company. I got really tight with the co title company. It's calling a couple of the agents. And I'm like, can we please just like three ways so you can tell her how this process is going to work? So we had to do like a couple calls where she just could just relax. Um, yeah. yeah. Her, I tagged her in some of the emails and stuff, which I don't yeah. recommend, yeah. but I had to do what I had to do just to close. 
So this is so, like another two weeks. Go ahead. I'll say something on that because uh, I think you did a lot of things well uh, with that. And and one of the biggest things, okay, is that when we're dealing with sellers and we're going direct to seller, so the, in, in these scenarios, there's not a there's not a trustworthy third party. And what I mean by that is, so when a seller is selling their house traditionally with a realtor, like they pick their realtor. And so their trust is then placed in that person that they hired to make, help them make decisions when it comes to selling their property. You know, when they go to sell a property, they get to they get to pick who their uh, attorney is that they work with. So they have trust inside of that. So when we come into wholesale, we're saying, hey, I want to buy your property with none of these people involved. And I want you to use my attorney. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to that's going to make some people uncomfortable. That's just the reality of it. Some people are going to get uncomfortable based on that. And so what's really important to understand, all right, is to do what Malik did. So one thing that I do on every single file is I, when I send in the file to open escrow with the attorney, I ask the attorney's paralegal to call the seller and let them know that they've received the file. Okay. And let them know what the process will be to close. Now the re and I explain this to the seller as well, but the reason I want my attorney's office to do it is because I want it to come from their contact, their phone number directly. I want them to feel the trust because there's a certain level of trust when, when an attorney is calling. All right. There's a certain amount of credibility that goes with being an attorney. And so when they get those phone calls that then explains the process, I have found that that helps close the gap on possible issues when it comes to um, them not understanding the process, them being upset uh, or something to that effect. So I would I would highly recommend implementing something like that, asking your title and make sure they do this because sometimes they won't. So I always make sure that they've called the seller. And what that does is it helps extend and build the credibility and trust that I then need with the seller. So you, you've, you've got a buyer at 22. Uh, the seller hits you up for another four. So now you're at, you're at, you're at 4,000, which is a really good take home, by the way. All right. So now you're at, you're at 4,000. Does this smooth sale to closing from there or, or what kind of happens? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. It never does, right? Nah. So, we're doing that process where I'm trying to make her more comfortable. And what you just said was a gem too. I wish I, I thought of that because I probably could have got a couple more deals because people get spooked, you know? They do. They yeah. Just don't understand it because it's not traditional, you know, it's buying and selling method. So that's exactly. something I have to implement in the future. But um, yeah, so, you know, we, we're going through that. So now this is the part that's wild. <clears throat> so this is probably a day or two before closing. Get her on the phone again with, my title agent and yeah she's like, okay this is how it's gonna work it's COVID right now we want to send a notary to your house like for you to sign blah 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 she well i'm literally on on a uh, uh, three-way call just in silent in the background she's like so you know as the owner of the house unfortunately you have to sign in front of a notary she was like i don't own the house and i'm like I was like, what? And then the title agent was like, what? And she was like, the title agent was like, your name is so-and-so, right? She was like, no, that's my husband. I was like, what? And this is, this is you've been talking to this lady the whole time. She responded to that name the whole two months. So she literally responded to the name. That name. So this is- For two <laughs> is months her. straight. So you, I just want to make sure I got this. All right. You call about the property. You ask for you ask for someone, whoever. OK, you ask for so and so. Yeah. She she speaks to you as if that's who she is. Yeah. Getting it under contract, coordinating, getting in the property, everything, checking to see what's going on, everything. She's responding as if she's that this person everything it was a unisex name so like either way i so that's why i, it, I didn't think of it yeah and so wait how close to closing did she say this two days two days before closing yeah this is crazy so two days, <laughs> two days. i was so bad so i'm like what so we're she all confused who says this to you 
the the lady that the uh that I was talking to the whole time, she said that. So you calling her like, hey, like, are you gonna sign this or what? No, we're on three way. So like, she's the my title agent just explaining the process of how closing's about to go, like in the next two days, and I'm just silent in the back, just letting her explain it. Cause you and like, then, yeah, I'm about to get my four. Yes, I was ready. Right. Yeah. And it was such a long process just to get that for it, and then you know whatever. So she said that, and I'm like. I was like, what? And then the agent, the agent was like, what? So she probably thought I was doing something crazy. I'm like, nah. So right, then right. she was like, the agent was like, so, I mean, this is so-and-so, right? Said the name again. She was like, that's my husband. And then she I was like, okay, that's weird. So she was like, okay. Um, is your husband going to be around for the closing tomorrow? Because we'll have to get him to sign then. And then she was like, my husband isn't here. And I'm like, well, I'm just like, okay. So. Wait, how did you think? Agent, <laughs> like, <laughs> the title agent was like, okay, so um, do you mind like telling me where he is? Like, is he out of town? He's like, my husband's in Africa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She said, my husband is in Africa. I was about to quit wholesaling, bro. Like, just before, I, like, I just, I was about Two to quit. Two days before I was Yeah. She, was this your first deal? No, nah, this is like my third. But either way, I'm just, I was fed up. Because she so, was cursing me out this whole time, too. It wasn't like she was nice or anything. Like, And you like, I ain't even talking, I ain't even talking to the, to the, the man. Exactly. He was in Africa this whole time. I didn't speak to him one time. So, yeah. Yeah, go, go, go. go. <laughs> I got I, 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 all in suspense. I got to know how this goes. Go ahead. Bro, I, so I was just like, I had to be quiet, though. So I was just on the phone, like, like just going crazy. And then I just let them hang up. And then I threw my phone. I was mad, bro. I don't even get mad like that. I threw my phone. I, thought, I was like, yeah, this is some BS. I called the agent later. I'm, I'm just like, I'm laughing at you. I could just I, I, I <laughs> hanging on you, bro. I'm like, man. I, that was just the most random thing ever. So I'm like, okay. Um, I called the title agent, and I'm just like, all right. I'm sorry. I didn't know what to say to her. Like, I don't know what's going on. Even, he in Africa. I told her a story too. She was like, dang, that's that's messed up. So she yeah, she felt it with me. So I was like, okay, what do we do now? And so we we literally still closed. It took an extra two weeks. So she was like, Well, this is the only option. We're gonna have to send the package to the lady via email. She's gonna have to email it to her husband in Africa. Her, her husband in Africa is gonna have to print it out go to a notary in Africa, get it signed in front of the notary, and then ship the document physically by plane to Michigan. I'm like, bro, <laughs> at that point, I didn't, almost didn't want the money no more. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Like, Yo, I, listen, I'm, I'm, this is why I'm laughing, all right, Malik? I'm laughing because I've, it's always the small deals with so much shit, right? It's not even always. worth it. And I, 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 I feel you because I've had deals – I had uh, I had a deal uh, a couple of months ago. I'm only gonna make five thousand, right? And it's not that I don't want five thousand. That's good money. I definitely want five thousand dollars. Right. So, but I'm dealing with so much shit with the owner, bro. That I'm just like, bro, this ain't, this ain't even worth it, man. This ain't even right. worth five. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like all this yelling back and forth, we on the phone cussing. It ain't. You, I'm stressed out. You know what I'm saying? You got me ready to go crazy. I'm like, yo, you know what? For my for my own mental health, I gotta stop thinking about this five thousand dollars, man. So I, That's I, what I, I was about to do. I feel Tell you, me, man. bro. I'm like, yo, it's not it's not worth it. Like it was taking away time from like my yeah, because all you yeah, I'm like, yo, what's good with this deal? I had to worry about her going ghost and cursing you and making her feel good. She just do all this stuff. I'm like, this is disrespectful. But I mean, <laughs> we got it done. Like, so it took an extra two weeks. Uh, this deal took so long, and it right. really tied me up. So I mean, she, we got it. He sent it. 
from Africa by plane. That's this is a motivated seller. Yeah, they had yeah. to get rid of it. They, yeah, and I, the I, reason I, why I, she wanted that money is, yeah, she wanted to take home um, at minimum five grand because they owed money on the property. So they, you know, the, uh, I got the you. taxes were going to get deducted. They wasn't taking home the whole, the whole 17. I mean, 22, yeah, that's the whole crazy. 17. That's crazy. So, so they had to get, sell it. You get this thing closed. You you make the four grand. I'm sure you're probably not even as excited anymore about the four grand as you were when you first got under the contract. But you know, this is also a good lesson about wholesaling. And in the sense of as wholesalers, we do what we need to do to get the deals closed. Uh, and, and that's not that's not the pretty part of real estate. That's not the HGTV type houses and, you know, doing this and doing that. That's the grunt hard work that most people don't want to do uh, to see closings happen, see deals get closed. Uh, so shout out to everybody that sees this is working through title issues, dealing with deals falling through, uh, having to jump through hula hoops to be able to get the closing uh, mailing uh, document packages from Africa. <laughs> Shout out to all of y'all, man, because wholesaling is, I say it all the time, but I mean it like wholesaling is for you got to be a, a real grinder to, to do wholesaling. You know, it's not a it's not a light thing. Uh, I mean, what's your insight on that, man? I mean, I, I know you, you said it's been about a year. You know, what's your insight on that? Right. Like, yeah. how do you find the energy to wholesale even when you have discouraging moments like this situation right here? How do you get just because we talked about it at the beginning of this conversation, right? This business is a business of highs and this is also a business of of lows. So how do you keep right. yourself from from being able to kind of balance in that? You just got to keep going, man, because I had periods where I wasted like two months, like just because I stopped marketing because I'm like, all right, it's not the last month. It was dry. You know, I got I still got my nine to five job. I'm like, I'm I'm not doing no marketing. That's why I said like overall it's been like a year and a half, but really like me locking in was probably about eight months, which uh, five deals in about eight months is pretty good, but I was locked in. But you just gotta kinda remember and and just keep learning because it's gonna get to a point where it's like, dang, I, I feel like I just I called all the list I possibly could in this area. So what do I do next? And that's when like joining a group like Charge the View, they give you different aspects on you know how you can stay hot and keep getting deals. So I think you just gotta know that every everybody's situation with wholesaling isn't the same. Like yeah, my first three months when I saw people in, in Max's Facebook group say, Yeah, I just started wholesaling last week. I just made twenty grand. Like I was mad as hell. Like, I'm like, bro, I've been doing this for like four months like but Listen, you can't yeah I want it's not real about, though let's talk about this i, I like yeah. this because i see I, I see this happen uh but nobody speaks about how it makes them feel necessarily but and, it, and this, this is this is a thought that every wholesaler every business owner in general honestly has to work through at some point i've had to work through it you're about to tell us how you've had to work like everybody has to work through that seeing the success of others especially when they've done they're doing it in a shorter period of time than you mm -hmm. it, it, it can it can affect you mentally right like it can it can make you think about certain like think about things and, and <clears throat> maybe this isn't for me maybe i shouldn't be doing this what was that like for you and then how did you work through that it was tough i mean especially because i i consider myself a very smart person so it's like I'm like, how is this not working right? Like, what am I not doing? Um, and then it gets confusing too, because it's like, there's so many ways where you can market. There's so many variables to get a deal in a wholesale deal. Literally hundreds of variables. Did I say the right thing? Did I market to the right house? Did I get out of the contract at the right price? Did I build enough rapport with the seller? So you just start to question everything, but it's really just like, you just got to realize it's just like with everything else. It's like nobody's path is really the same. Somebody, some people may really kill it initially. Personally, I think if somebody gets a deal in a week when they start, it's just luck because that usually never happens. Um, but there's a lot of variables. I mean, like I said, I mean, they could have been in a 
perfect place, perfect time. Like the market was well, the, that person that they contacted was ready right then and there. If you can go through hundreds of contacts in a list and nobody's ready to sell and you can't really do nothing about it. If they're not motivated, if they're not ready, there's just certain things you can't control with wholesaling. It's more like a probability game where you yeah, reach out yeah. to as many motivated people you you know as you can and catch them at the right time. So it's just it's it's time. So it's gonna eventually you eventually get a deal. Like Yeah, so I'm glad you brought this up. I think this is a great conversation. I appreciate you sharing too. Uh, cause like I said, a lot of people aren't willing to have this conversation. And I think I think the biggest thing I see my guy uh, Dylan just just posted this. I posted this on Facebook I think a week or two ago. Um, comparison is the thief of joy, mm -hmm. and we all suffer from this. We all deal with it in different capacities. I do, Malik does. We it's, it's human nature. We all do, and and what that is is because um, we want certain things, and a lot of times we want them so bad, and when we see that things aren't happening for us the way that we wanted to or when we wanted to our immediate response generally a lot of times is to stop or to give up on it uh, and that's a dangerous mindset but that's just real and that's just how it is sometimes and so you know i know sometimes seeing these things and you know you see and it's like oh this person got a deal in a month and this is why i share the fact it took me two years to do a deal so the important part about it is staying consistent and despite those things continue to put foot for put a foot forward every day mm -hmm. to move towards closing deals and making things happen the reality of it is everybody every i say this all the time every man has his own journey all right like malik just said too and so you can't compare your process or where you're at to anybody else because there's so many variables involved in that you know like you don't know how many hours a day that person is working on their business. You don't know what that person's budget was. You don't know if their first deal happened to come from a, fr a family member or a friend that right. happened to have a house set to sell at the time. Like you, you don't know. And right. it's not worth driving yourself crazy or beating yourself up um, when you see these conversations or see these stories about other people having success. What you have to do at the end of the day is ask yourself one critical question. Am I being consistent enough? If the answer is yes, then you keep doing what you're doing. Continue to right. be consistent. And it's like Malik said, it, it's a prob it's probability effect. Like if you're going to, if you're consistent, you're going to close the deal eventually. 110%. Exactly. I got now, something to add too. Sorry, I mean sure. to cut you off. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go. I think another thing, a big thing for me is if you live in a market and it's a very, very tough competitive market, expensive market. You, you got a lot of competitors, like a major city like New York City, Seattle, what, wherever. Uh, I, I'd say don't be afraid to virtually wholesale and move out of that market. It took me, I didn't get a deal for five, six, five, five months because I was doing it in my immediate area near Washington, D.C. It was hard, man. Like I'm dealing with heavy hitters. You know, my my mom gets sent mail from home buyers, home buyers of America every week. You know, you're dealing with people on TV. So as soon as I switched markets to a more niche market, I was able to get the ball rolling. Like, so I would say, don't be afraid to to switch out, and move out to a different market that has more opportunity. Um, that was my biggest thing because I, I still haven't closed a deal in my city. And that's one of my goals, just just to do it. But I mean, yeah, yeah, just to but, get it done. But it's, it's, it's tough. Thing. Yes, look, there's there are going to be markets that are harder than others. That's a fact. Okay, um, but at the end of the day, like Malik is saying, and this is why I think it's clear to get the messaging right on the fact that virtual wholesaling is not something different than wholesaling. Mm -hmm. It's it's the exact same thing. Virtual wholesaling is literally a marketing term that was created. All right. So you can do deals in other markets and don't be afraid to test other markets out. Mm -hmm. Test other markets out. See what type of impact you can have in those markets. See what type of response you get back on your marketing in another market. And and, and you got to give it a shot. Right. Uh, you know, uh, these Midwest cities or states like Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, K 
Kansas City, you know, like all these different places. Like there's a lot of activity happening in those markets because of pricing. Right. So you gotta you gotta pick a market, get committed to it, and 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 try and, and ultimately again it just goes back to what I just said a minute ago. What you gotta ask yourself all the time when you're analyzing your business, when you're analyzing why things aren't going a certain way, while you're analyzing why this isn't working and da 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 am I being consistent enough? If the answer is yes, then you continue to move forward. But this is an honest, this is an honest self question, right? This is a very honest self question because you're asking this to yourself. So see the thing when you're dealing with yourself and talking to yourself, there's no need to lie to you. All right. You can fake it to everybody else or fake it to other people. Oh, I'm doing this. Oh. Listen, you got to ask yourself internally or in the mirror, am I being consistent enough? If the answer is yes, stay active. Keep it pumping. Your time is coming. If the answer is no, then you need to spend some time to recalibrate and make a decision. Is this something I want to do or not? And if it is, then I need to get committed to the consistency of what I'm doing. Hundred percent. That first one feels amazing too. So I would that that first one was a, it's not a filling out trade for a lot of things. So because of that that grind that you put in initially, like not getting it for X amount of months, I would actually rather have it that way because it, it just proved to me that the work I put in was for a reason. As opposed yeah. to just getting, you know, lucky with a deal in two weeks, I probably yeah. would have tripped off like the last, you know, the next few months because I thought it was easy. So, you know, it, it's it's definitely rewarding when you go through that and then you get that first deal. No doubt. And uh, you know, shout out to Marketing Enterprises, former youth student. Much love, man. I appreciate you. Malik's a former youth student. All right. Um, yep. Listen, guys, the, the, look, I, I love Malik. I love anybody. All right, you come into the U, you leave the U, you always family. All right, don't mean nothing just because you leave the U. All right, it's a progressive situation. All right, uh, and so and, and things change for people. I understand that. So so shout out to to Market Enterprises. Uh, sincerely, man, appreciate that love, man. My goal, my mission for for 2020 uh, and going into 2021 was to help as many people as possible either do their first deal or create a real consistent business and start to do multiple deals a month. That that was my goal. That's why I created Charged Up University. Uh, that's what I'm focused on, and, and and that's what I'm looking to do to have impact and uh, in, 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 in people that are coming up in the game, so to speak, uh, in their lives, man. So uh, let's get some questions in here, man, if, if you're good with that. Uh, I know we're at the 8 o'clock mark, but uh, if you got time, man, I'll, I'll make some extra time, and we can keep it pumping for a little bit and, yeah, uh, and knock sure. out some questions. Does that work? For sure, yeah, definitely. All right, let me, let me scroll up and, and see what we uh, – See, we have all the way to Africa for four thousand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody said, "Somebody said Africa is a big ass continent." No, that's <laughs> oh, all, right. all right, let me see. I know I saw some questions, but let me uh, let me scroll back up a little bit. If you asked a question, I did not pick it to answer already. Uh, help me out and repost it. And uh, I'll try to answer it in case I didn't see it earlier. Somebody asked, uh, Oli, Oli Fit asked, how long would you experiment in a new market before trying another one? All right. Yeah, yeah. I see that one right here. There we go. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a good question. So I think I wouldn't necessarily give it a time, time frame. It's more so a feel. So if you're actually in contact and you're making contact with sellers, you you know on that Facebook page, I recommend always joining the Facebook groups in that market first because it's just free game. You see who's who's buying, who's who's wholesaling, what you know what they're looking for. You can literally ask in the group where is where are you guys buying, um, and then you'll get the answers. So I'll just give it a feel. Um, I can't really give you an exact time span, but you you'll know when it's like it's dry and it's like. There's really nothing going on in this in this immediate market for me. But if you got a lot of energy flowing, talking to people, even though you didn't close yet, I probably still keep it going. No doubt. Yeah. Um, so my opinion on this, how long to experiment in a new market before trying another one? Uh, you got to give it a couple of months. Uh, you know, no question about it. 
Uh, you can't you can't hit a market for a week or a couple of weeks and really expect to see some traction. And again, you have to do this consistently. I want to be real clear when I say being consistent, that doesn't mean that your budget is five hundred dollars a month and you spend five hundred this month. Don't get a deal. So then you don't spend any money next month. Still don't get a deal. And then it's 90 days later and you're like, ah, maybe I'll spend instead of five hundred. So I haven't gotten a deal yet. I'll spend two fifty. You, you got to consistently ex extend whatever your budget is because that's what's going to bring in uh, those deal opportunities. Um, do you recommend the dollar amount of e uh, EMD be written on the purchase and sell agreement? Oh uh, yeah, I mean that's just it, it was probably standard for me. I usually yeah. just put like a grand because my market's so cheap. Um, but whatever makes the seller feel comfortable. I mean, you're not the one paying for it anyways. Um, so yeah. yeah, guys, you want to, you want to make sure that you put that in your contract uh, for yeah. sure. You guys definitely want to do that. Um, all right, let me see. We got some questions pulling in. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, here's a good one. All right. So how do you figure out uh, how much to pay your boots on the ground? No pressure. Uh, Cause I know this is your brother. All right. So no yeah. pressure. Whatsoever. All right. Uh, but yeah. how do you figure out how much to pay your boots on the ground? Yeah, shout out to my brother Darius. Uh, that's my older brother too. So, dope, dope. Um, we we split it pretty decently. So, um, it's like sixty forty, which to me, I thought was fair because it's it's almost like the same thing you'd be doing if you JV with another yeah. person in a different market. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think you know my brother earns his keep because he does a lot of running around. But it's really it's up to you. Um, yeah. It could be cheaper and you could do it a, in a different way as well, like paying per per hour or something like that. But we just establish it to keep it simple. I like your response on that. You can you can definitely do it cheaper than, you know, 40 percent. Um, now, l l let me start by saying I'm I personally love 50 50. All right. I don't do deals with anybody if it isn't 50 50. And, and the reason being is that it's just a, it's a simple, easy place marker so that we can, we just know what it is and we can just keep moving. I see a lot of people that get so caught or stuck on the money piece and then it impacts the way you're able to do business together later. And what I mean by that is, you know, if 50-50 if is, is typically kind of how it goes, but you know, you're telling somebody, hey, I can give you 10% or 20% or whatever the case might be, it could possibly impact the way they, they handle your business mm -hmm. as, as they move forward. And it's not that's not worth it to me. So the reason right. I like 50, 50 is if I'm going to have a boots on the ground that I can handle deal to, they're going to take it, get it sold, deal with the buyers or whatever the case might be. The 50 50 is worth it simply because it's some if I trust this person, I can I can set it and forget it. I don't have to I don't have to worry about did they call the buyers back. I don't have to worry about are they checking with the title company or. Did they go out and take pictures? Like, I just know they're going to do what they need to do. So the 50 50 makes sense. Um, now you can use things like BPO photo flow and, you know, some of these other sites that I've recommended before to pay somebody to go out uh, and, and look at the property. But um, how much more dope is it to make money with your family, your older brother at that? You know what I mean? You and your older brother get to do something together. I mean, right. That's that's worth the money. I mean, that's worth it to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so, no, nah, salute to you on that, my man, for sure. Um, where is the best place to uh, to buy a list? Charge up list, man. And yeah, that's a Fendi fact. Uh, <laughs> y'all check out list dot com. It's in the description. Um, Cyber fifty right now. Now look, if you haven't gotten a list, it's fifty percent off right now. I don't know when we're gonna cut that off. Uh, probably here pretty soon because a lot of y'all been buying lists at really good prices. All right. But 50% uh, off all lists right now. And I'm telling y'all here first, actually, uh, Chris's favorites have been updated. So I've updated my favorite list on chargeduplist.com. So make sure you go check it out. Cyber 50 will give you 50% off. I've put my hottest list of 2020 on there. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, and uh, and leak also PropStream. Shout out to PropStream. Uh, if you need a free trial, chargedupdata.com. It's below in the description of this video as well. Uh, you get 10,000 records from PropStream a month. T test those records. Try those records out.
Uh, for you guys that are students, go look at the video from PropStream. All right, there's a lot of critical information in that video about how you can put different lists together utilizing PropStream. Uh, when we had Burton from PropStream come and join us a couple of weeks ago, so shout out to Burton for, for giving us some crazy insight on that. But uh, yeah, check out PropStream for sure. Um, who is the title company that came through for you? Detroit Tyler and Escrow. Shout out to them. Shout out they to Detroit. The job done. Yeah. Yes. That question looked like it came from Detroit Title and Escrow. Like, <laughs> right. Like when the when the cook when the cook is leaving the Yelp review, but nah, shout out to <laughs> Detroit Title and Escrow. Uh, glad they were able to help you out, man. So big shout out to them. Um, how do you know what new market to tap into virtually? Um, that's a good question. I just did research, just listening to podcasts, just being around just the real estate market. You hear what's hot. Um, but I specifically chose my, you know, market in Michigan because, I mean, we're looking for motivated sellers. So in that regard, you, you know, you can look up the demographics of a city and see what's going on with people, you know, right. from a financial right. sense. And, and you know, that, mid yeah, yeah, exactly. That Midwest area, um, it's a little bit more, uh, people have encountered a little bit more problems in those areas. So. You know, I felt that if I was looking for motivation, it makes more sense for me to to target that in a, in a demographic sense. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I definitely agree with that. Um, let me see something here. One second. So let me see this next one. Um, this is a good one. I like this. Um, not real estate related, but what did you spend your first uh, uh, your first uh, wholesaling check on. Yeah, so I paid my brother and then I just, I didn't pay myself. I actually uh, just put it all back into the business and started marketing again. So Great it's not a cool story, but I already, I already got like all the stories of what you shouldn't do way before I got the deal. So I pretty much knew I wasn't going to spend it. If, if I got the whole 17 though, I probably would have took a grand and did something for myself but once i got seven grand knocked off i'm like nah i gotta re reinvest this nah no nah, that's uh that's dope man so so you know you did it the right way um look my first wholesale check was a very long time ago uh you know 10 plus years ago i was a young fella at the time all right <laughs> and uh yeah i blew that uh, I, 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 <laughs> I put that one as, as soon as it hit. Uh, I might have kept it a couple of days. I mean, we went and we balled out on that one, you know. <laughs> you know, all the shoes that I had been wanting, yeah. had to go, so, you know, went to somebody club and, and wasted a bunch of money. So don't do what Malik did. Do not do what I did in that scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, just take but, out a small amount for yourself if you really need to. I okay. think, yeah, like, I think I actually, see, I'm trying to act all good. I think I, I bought, like, a Wizards ticket, but our team is <laughs> our team is trash, so it's not expensive. So it was, like, $80. <laughs> Other than that's that, it. that's it. I ain't spending no, no more. Uh, how would you do an open house for buyers or something similar if a seller lives in the house? Great question. All right. Uh, Malik, do you want to take this one? you want me to answer it? Uh, you can take that one. All right. So here's here's exactly what I do. Uh, you have to have an additional vetting step with your buyers. So typically, like if the house is vacant, you got a lot box on it. A lot of it's very, you know, hey, go take a look at the property. The lock box code is one, two, three, four. Let me know if you're interested. Boom, boom, boom. When a house is occupied by the buyer or by the sellers and or the tenants, all right, then this can become a little bit more tricky. And so what you have to do is you have to have incredibly good pictures and videos first. So you have to have very thorough photos of the entire property, interior and exterior, and you need to have photos of the systems, HVAC, the electrical panel, the roof, all right, the condition of the siding and the windows. You need to make sure you're covering those for sure in your photos, all right? Now, the other piece to this, OK, is you need to do a video walkthrough and that video walkthrough. 
okay, is simply done because you want to give somebody a visual feel with video of what the property looks like. So if you can get in and get that before you need to put your buyers in, then that's what you want to do. And then the next part of this is then when you get this out to your buyers list and people are letting you know they're interested in your property or in your deal, you want to be very clear with them. So you're not bringing anybody to the property that doesn't have a proof of funds, all right, that doesn't have very clear interest in the property. So they, 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 it needs to be somebody that when you communicate with them about the house, you can very clearly tell that it's one of those like they just need to get in there and take a look at it to make sure they want to buy it. And so what you're going to do is you're going to narrow that down to two to five buyers. All right. The lower amount of buyers you do this with, the better, but two to five buyers. So you want to narrow that list down to two to five people. And then you're going to run the appointment to the seller with those two to five people. And they're going to be a part of your team. They're going to be your contractors, your bankers, uh, people who work for you, that kind of thing. All right. And then you're going to use that and do that all at one open house. Um, have you ever tried? Awesome gems. Yeah. Now you guys got to do that. Um, Gain City. Have you ever tried a slow market like Pittsburgh? I have not. Believe I don't know if you have any experience with Pittsburgh. I haven't either. But it sounds like seems like it'll be good based on demographic research I did. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, Pittsburgh's a good market. I, I don't have any personal experience there, but uh, there's people definitely making money in Pittsburgh. Uh, shout out to the UFAM as well on that. Uh, I think it depends on the amount of leads that you're generating. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, th that's always going to change. So, you know, it, it just depends. Uh, let me see what else we got here. Where's the best place to purchase list? We talked about that. Uh, here's a good one. How often do you get fresh lists? I'll be milking my list. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't even know if I'm if I'm doing it the right way. Um, but I, I really recycle my list until a certain contact rate where it's like, okay, you know, the people that I haven't contacted, they're not answering either. And then I'll get a fresh one. So I can't really put a time limit on it. It depends on how good the list is initially, how big the list is. Uh, what about you, Chris? Yeah, so um, so I get lists monthly. However, uh, the my lists roll over. And I, the analogy I like to use is like rollover minutes from back in the day. I'm 34, so I'm not. I don't want to date myself. All right, but back in the day, I, can you say 34? Uh, at 34, you can say back in the day, right? Back in the yeah. day. No, all right. No, I'm not trying to play you, but I mean, you could you could say that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm getting old. I'm <laughs> You're not getting old. old. So back in the day, AT and T, I remember had rollover minutes. So like, you could pay for two thousand minutes a month, but if you only used a thousand minutes, a thousand minutes would roll to the next month. Any list I buy, any list you guys buy, should absolutely roll over to the next month. All right, so that you're you're building up your data stack, and that's how you increase the amount of leads you're able to call in a dollar. You're able to text. You're able to voicemail drop is because you're constantly increasing the size of your overall list. So you should not be buying a list, working that list, and then discarding it to get another list. Mm -hmm. You should be buying a list, working that list, and then buying new lists to add into the amount of lead, or, or amount of records that you're already pursuing. That's a gem. That yeah, probably would have helped me a lot. Probably could close twice as many deals. No doubt. Uh, how much of your, I, I know you mentioned this, that you reinvested, but how you made, how much did you make on your first deal? How much did you reinvest? 10 grand. I put 6K back in. I paid my brother for. Don't, don't ask me. Don't, you know. Oh, yeah. Minus the $80 for the game. So whatever that was. But yeah, I yeah. spent more, I, I spent more than 80 on Wizards tickets. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. You know what I'm saying? But don't. Yeah. don't like me, do not, don't go crazy like I did. I was mad young. All right, you don't must have been on the floor then, because man, I want, I, want, I want on the floor, but I, I could, you know, what I mean, I could reach out and touch it a little. You get what okay, I'm saying? Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want too far. I want, I want. Too I know far exactly away. where you was at. The Wizard Floor tickets, they, you know, they, they don't, they don't hit like they ain't Golden State Warriors tickets. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Um, can, you, can you speak on needing to get title insurance for tax sales properties or is title insurance something that is going to be standard? 
you absolutely should have title insurance on every single transaction. Right. If you do deals and don't have title insurance, and I can tell you this from experience, you will run into significant problems potentially one day. All right. I'll give a quick story real quick. I had a property I bought in, I think, 2018, I believe, late 2018 or early 2019. I bought the property. All right. Purchased it. Uh, I can't remember for how much. I want to say like 20, 17500 I believe. OK. Purchased the property and I flipped it to wholesale it. So I wholesaled it for, I think, 55000 All right. Now, when I went to go sell it to the end buyer, I was told that they could not get title insurance because the title was bad on the property. All right. The only reason I was able to get this situation worked out. Now, this is a lot of money we're talking about. I had it. I bought it for 17000 I was selling it for fifty five. The only reason we were able to salvage it and get it resolved was because I had a title policy on the property. Uh, do not buy properties without clear title. Mm -hmm. I'm in the process of acquiring a duplex on an FHA loan. Any advice on what to be cautious of when investing in multifamily property? Um, yeah. So uh, you get an inspection. Number one, uh, you want to get a good inspection. If you're in Richmond, Virginia, uh, reach out to me. I'll give you the inspector that I use. A uh, really good dude, but you want to get the property uh, fully inspected. And you also want to make sure that you can actually afford the property in the event that you did not have any rent income coming in whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that you're looking to house hack because you're on an investment show. So I'm assuming you're looking to house hack. And Malik, you can speak on this too. I want you to talk about this because you're, you're in the process of looking to do something similar. You want to yeah. make sure that you can cover that monthly payment regardless if you're making income from the other side or not. Now that's not the plan. All right. But you want to make sure that you can cover it in the event that something changes. Uh, Malik, how would you respond to that? man? Yeah, you're exactly, exactly right. Um, I'm actually doing the exact same thing, Ted. So that's crazy. I'm actually trying to, you know, do the same house hacking thing, duplex or triplex off of FHA. Um, I actually put in an offer already, but I, I lost by four grand. So I was a little sick. But, um, yeah, it's all right. But, yeah, the, uh, basically what you say, you hit it on the nose because I actually saw a property that I really liked because it was in a it was in a cool area in Richmond, actually, um, in Church Hill. And, you know, Church Hill is hot. So oh, yeah. it's crazy. Up there. I, I love that area. But I, you got to really think for your like my biggest advice would be one what Chris said, which is if anything happens, you want to be able to afford that because I had a opportunity where i could airbnb one of the units and really make a substantial amount but if it didn't go right then i would have been stuck with a hefty mortgage and then secondly you kind of want to separate between like i really want to live in this area and is this a better investment because like you're going to really butt heads with that which is what i mean by that is like i personally want to live in church hill Chimborazo because it's super dope over there. But the yeah. properties are going, you know, the property values and the rents aren't really merged yet. So it's like you're going to have to take give or take on one of those. What you may be able to go to a different area may not be as cool. You may have to sacrifice a little bit. But as far as an investment goes, it makes, you know, 10 times more sense. So you may have to think, OK, should it, is this a cash flow play? Cause the area is not as great right now or is it an equity play because okay my cash flow is going to be pretty bad but this house should appraise based on how hot this area is and what it's been doing over the last few years so that's that's actually my personal dilemma that i've been trying to figure out so we can work through it together bro to be honest i love it man i love it no that's that's absolutely phenomenally great advice um guys something that malik just said is really important and what that was is you know, there's a part of town that he who would prefer to live in, that he would like to live in, um, that he probably would uh, it would be a better place for him to live right now. However, he's 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 making this decision and purchasing this property to house hack with an investment mindset first. And ultimately, at the end of the day, to be candid, um, you know, and I'll say this to, uh, about Malik, I'll say this to you directly because you, you're in the process of this. The actual reality of it, too, is that Churchill wouldn't even be a good place to house hack right now. 
because the Churchill market has peaked up, uh, you know, uh, a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you always house hacking to me and I haven't house hacked, but the concept to house hack, I would want to do that in an emerging market. Right. And so what I'm by that, I got a buddy of mine, shout out to Francis Martel in, in I think five or six years ago, maybe even longer than that. He bought a, a duplex in Churchill. I might've mentioned him to you, uh, Malik. He bought a property in Churchill, a duplex, but at the time Churchill was just starting to emerge. All right. As a really, really hot market in the city. Okay. Right. Got into the property. He held it for a couple of years. He house hacked it, rented one side, lived in the other. Then a few years later, he went to sell it. He made 200 something thousand dollars. Okay. But he was able to do that because he went in on a neighborhood before it was red hot, before it was the best neighborhood to live in and all the restaurants, right. and all of that. So it's patient capital. You know, right. it's putting it's, it's the concept of putting off what you want or what you feel that you need or want today for the better game later. And I can tell you from experience, playing the long game is always going to be best. All right. Uh, hey, how do Chris, you capital? Go, 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 go. Can I, can I get like two or three emerging, emerging, uh, Neighborhoods yes. for me real quick. If I was you, all right, um, if I was going to be p picking anywhere right now to do what you're trying to do in Richmond, Virginia, it needs to be either uh, 23224, 23234, 23225, uh, or 23235. So that south side corridor, all right? Um, if you want to get a return on your money in a couple of years, if you really want to catch a lick, all right. Um, you need to be focused on South Side of Richmond, 110 percent that Manchester. And I'm not talking about the immediate Manchester area. Mm -hmm. All right. You've been down there. Uh, that immediate Manchester area has already peaked because of all the commercial development. Right. You don't want to be right in that pocket. Blackwell, Swansboro, stuff like that, that Jefferson Davis corridor. It's not going to be. It ain't Churchill. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. But five years from now. You're going to walk away where you can put some money in your pocket and you can ball out a little bit. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so it's so definitely, yeah, definitely get that some thought. That's definitely the goal. Um, how do you cal calculate ARV? Uh, I usually don't. I just do the as is comp method. Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, ARV, I mean, if I do do it, if there is a situation, because I have done it before, um, I really just look at recent comps within six months. They don't have six, six months, and I do push it back to a year, even though I don't like to. Um, right. And then I'll probably have a, a agent friend cross reference it if possible. But usually the comps are simple. Sometimes they are hard to do, and that's when I just do the as is comps. Yeah, I agree. Um, CJ2K or CJ2Live. Um, yeah, go, go listen, go on my YouTube and take a look at the comp video that I have up on, on my YouTube channel. Uh, that that's we need to watch that. It's going to give you some crazy game. Uh, if it helps you, leave me a comment on the on the on the video. Uh, so I know you're able to check it out and it was uh, and it was helpful for you, man. Uh, let me see what else we got. We got a lot of questions, man. So I mean, that's good. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to let you take this one, but let me explain. So, Chris, can you break down your typical day? Do you just focus on new money daily? Uh, that's an interesting second sentence. Um, I actually don't focus on money at all, uh, which I know sounds, uh, you know, uh, contradictory or whatever the case might be. But I have no I have no I do not wake up with a focus on money whatsoever uh, on a daily basis. Um, I wake up with a focus on my processes, my systems and what I'm focused on doing and what I'm mm -hmm. focused on trying to accomplish. And I learned a long time ago by not worrying about money at all and just focusing on my process, just focusing on my system. Whatever money that I want to make uh, is going to come. And likely when I put that type of focus on something, more money than I actually anticipated in the first place is actually going to come. Uh, as far as a typical day, I'm going to let Malik break down a typical day for him. Uh, and the reason I'm not going to is just simply because I've got multiple businesses. I've got a lot of different things going on. Uh, you know, my company does other things than just wholesale. And right. also, also, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn when I say this, but also my business is in uh, a more elevated place. And I want I want this answer to be really helpful for you. Uh, and, and the best way to be able to do that 
is to have somebody answer at this working a nine to five, like you may be, or, you know, just starting out and trying to figure out how to balance their day out and what, what makes sense with that. So Malik, how would you uh, answer that question? man? Okay. Yeah. Right now is a little different. I actually put wholesaling on hiatus for a little bit because I started a brand new job in October. Uh, yeah. In October. And it's, it's crazy. It's like yeah. very demanding 50 hours a week type of thing. And I'm looking for a house. So I put it on a hiatus for a little bit. But prior to that, I would wake up um, and I actually still had my nine to five working from home. But I had a notebook where I listed out all the uh, my to do list, um, even minor things, crossing those things off. I like to put minor things on there, too, because you just get a flow. of okay, I'm being productive today. So putting clothes in the laundry, whatever, crossed it off. You see things crossed off. You keep going. Um, but I had time blocks where I do my regular nine to five work. I might have to follow up with a seller because he asked or she asked, call me at noon. So I just right. block that out, write that down, you know, something slight like that. And then I always after work, I start getting on it. Well, my VA was getting on a dialer. I only had a part time VA, too. So everything I've done was like I didn't have an eight hour a day caller. I wasn't doing this eight hours a day. This is all this wholesaling stuff I've been doing was after work and with four hour calls per day, which, you know, people are doing a lot more so you can get it done. So she would yeah. call. And then during that process, I pick up some of the calls that came in internally because sometimes I never figured out the process of having a, a, an inbound process too. So the outbound process is pretty simple, but you know, getting that inbound flow automated was something I didn't do. So I would just take care of myself. So I dedicated like four to eight o'clock to wholesaling. Sometimes I go do random stuff like work out or whatever, but just making sure I get those calls in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it wasn't, it was pretty chill. I mean, I was dedicated, so it was, it was cool. And let, and let me ask you this. What was your, what was your monthly what was your monthly budget when you were doing these deals? I think that's a good question uh, because a lot of people think that the budget needs to be something drastic or crazy. What was your monthly budget when you were doing these deals? Yeah, I'd probably say between initially it was like 500 bucks, but then it got up to like 750 to a thousand after I, you know, after I did my deal, I ramped it up. Yeah. Yeah. I ramped it up. Um, and I, I started doing it a little bit before too just so I can get more more call flow. I didn't get a, a VA until after my first deal. And you know, the VA costs, that's the best investment I made because those calls are, calling is the most tedious thing. It's the worst part to me, so. Yeah, getting somebody else on the on the phone for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Keith Jackson. Chris, I got a hold of that owner that ghosted me. I kept following up and got the deal locked up. My first deal five months got a buyer making fifteen thousand virtually on his first text campaign man big boss What's salute. Up, bro? yeah big big boss salute out to to my guy here uh keep jackson man congratulations on that sir congrats and, uh, bro and, and much love um me uh and, and look you guys you show you show love to to keep in the comments for sure um what's your what's your business plan What's your plan for your business in 2021? You're asking me personally? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. So I got a lot of plans and I'm doing a few things with wholesaling and outside of wholesaling, too. So basically, when I get my my current job under control a little bit more, um, I have an Airbnb initiative I'm doing for overseas athletes that I'm working on. So I partner with an Airbnb company who manages Dope. Airbnbs. So we're basically targeting the overseas guys and girls who don't have a place to stay when they come back. So we'll get them a property in Airbnb while they're overseas and then they have a place to stay when they come back. So I've been doing a lot of marketing for that and revamping that. And I think just being in the wholesale game this last year, I know exactly what I have to do moving forward once I get my feet on the ground again with you yeah. know, this new job settles in. Um, and my brother is more experienced too. So we have an idea of hitting about three markets at a time. We were solely doing Michigan and I was doing a little bit around the DMV just to try to see if I can do it. Um, but we have a whole thing set up 
we got our VA on on prem right now. You know, she loves us so much, and you know, her boss that you know, her boss is like, hey, when are you guys gonna be ready again? So I already told her my my strategy too. So I think yeah. it's gonna be good leading into 2021 because housing market is it's a little funny right now for me in the market yeah. I was in. So it's it's gonna be good. I'm gonna get back to wholesaling soon and uh, my Airbnb thing. Respect, respect. Um, let me see some here. All right, so here's another one. Now I, I know you're not in the U anymore. So, all right, because I know you're focused on work. Uh, and so congratulations, by the way, man, on your on your new position too, man. Much respect. Thank um, you. Appreciate. It. I, don't, I don't know if you're up on the secret weapon, the launch codes yet. If you are, uh, don't share it. All right, just yet because mm -hmm. I haven't seen it uh, public. But uh, what systems do you use to stay with follow ups? Well, me personally, yeah. Honestly, I just use a spreadsheet. I mean, there you can buy Podio um, to do automated follow ups. And then I actually, you know, switched over to Call Tools. <clears throat> Call Tools is a very, very sophisticated dialer and they make it, they have a, um, what do you call it, kind of a CRM setup in there too that makes it easier to track. So uh, just either that or a spreadsheet. I try to cut down my, mar my expenses, my margin expenses as much as possible while still remaining functional so no doubt no doubt uh yeah and, and guys i like this answer because uh look you we, you can use a spreadsheet I, I got a i got a personal friend that i know personally has done hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars all right and never had a crm never had podio any of that and it closed a lot of deals if you can stay organized i know malik is a very analytical uh, on top of it type of guy. So if you can manage things in a spreadsheet, uh, then then do that uh, 100, 110%. Um, Chris, I'm having issues with the comp. Can you run some for me? The short is hard to comp at times. Listen, God oh, body, yeah. um, if, you're, if you're in Charged Up University, um, I do comps on the weekly calls if people need some help with comps uh, when we have time. So you can we have a call tomorrow at 6 p.m. You can bring that onto the call tomorrow. Uh, also, when charged up, you uh, there is a uh, comp chat. There's a, a private chat, not private. It's a public chat room, but there's a chat room in charged up specifically for comps and getting help with comps. Uh, so go jump into that chat room inside the inside the group. Um, let's see. I have something for him too. Sorry, go ahead. Chris, because uh, he mentioned Detroit. Detroit is going to be a lot of as is comps because uh, a lot of the you know we both know a lot of the city the houses are literally five thousand six thousand dollars just like baltimore so you're gonna yeah. have to do compare it to basically what was the lowest sold in that area and that's probably going to be the cash comps so you just try to get it below that so you can pitch it to somebody or you move to the outskirts into the suburbs where it's a little bit easier yeah and god god body listen if you haven't go on my youtube channel and take a look at the video on uh comps all right make sure you go watch that and implement the as is comp method uh for sure uh do you think bandit signs are effective i uh, went just starting out bandit signs uh can be uh it should be one of those initial items to purchase what's your thoughts on that Malik? man all mine got stolen so i can i don't have no data on that <laughs> yeah I have no I'm, data. yeah i'm not a bandit sign guy um you know do they work yes but the the reality of it is too with the way things are now, price wise, cost wise, you can buy a list, you know, of, of a thousand records for one hundred and twenty bucks. Uh, I'd rather spend, you know, you're going to spend that to get the signs. I, I'd right. rather spend that money on getting a list of a thousand records uh, that I can contact and reach out to uh, versus, you know, trying to do that another way. So, um, right. yeah, I would definitely recommend that. Malik, okay. yo, it's been a pleasure. Um, I appreciate you jumping on here tonight. Uh, what do you What do you want to leave the people with uh, before we tap out of here, man? Man, uh, I would just say, just be, just remain consistent. Like I, I understand if anybody hasn't gotten a deal yet, or if it's slow right now. Um, We've all pretty much been through it, especially Chris has been in the game for so long. I'm really new to it, but I've had good months consecutively. I had really bad months consecutively. 
Um, you just try to stay on top of, you know, getting knowledge. I already learned some things on this call that I'm going to implement the stuff that I wish I had asked, you know, in the charge of you group while I was there. Um, so I would say just stay engaged when you need it. And I will also say um, don't overthink and overanalyze and be too involved in group stuff as well. You got to kind of learn on your own at some point with certain things. Um, so I, like me personally, I may, I may be in a group heavy for a week trying to figure some things out. And then I may go, go ghost for like two weeks. Cause I'm just really in the field. So just, you know, be relying on yourself and trust yourself too. I like that. Trust yourself. Now that's a bar. Um, yeah, man. Guys, look, we'll get ready to get out of here. Malik, man, I, I really, really appreciate you coming through, uh, sure. sharing your situation, uh, dropping some gems, man. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure, man. I'm glad we're able to do this. Um, it's the Slow Feet Don't Eat podcast. You already know. Shout out to all the Charged Up University family. Uh, if you need prop stream, if you need Charged Up list, if you're interested in becoming one of my students uh, in Charged Up University, uh, go look in the description of this video. Uh, tap in with us. Uh, you know, if we can take care of you, we'd be we'd be more than happy to help you uh, reach your goals uh, when it comes to the business and, and the different things that you're trying to do. Uh, Malik, I'm going to get ready to get out of here, man. It was a pleasure. Uh, really appreciate you. Uh, Charged Up fam, uh, YouTube fam, much, much love.